What's up guys? Welcome back to A Sense of Travel. I'm Michael Matheny. I'm on a mission on this channel to document the sights, sounds, tastes, feels, and smells of cities, countries, and natural landmarks around the world to immerse you into the travel experience experientially. This week, I'm in Germany's ever-changing and ever-reinventing capital city, Berlin. I'm stoked to bring you along. This is a really cool place. So let's get started. Berlin is cool. There's no better way to put it. Even just walking through the streets, you get this sensation of grit and edge that says, I am unashamedly who I am. It may not seem like this means anything, but Berlin was the first city in Europe where I didn't get weird looks for wearing gym shorts and a t-shirt around town instead of my sleekest, most stylish outfit. That's saying something. Germany's capital city is huge. It's home to 3.7 million people in the city alone, and the entire capital region has over 6.2 million people. A city this size will always have stories to tell, but in Berlin's case, those stories have implications for the entire world. Layers and layers of medieval and modern history blanket Berlin, and have created the dynamic, eclectic, countercultural city that stands today. Experiencing Berlin virtually isn't something you can do through pictures or writing alone. To place yourself imaginatively in these gritty streets, you have to immerse through all five senses. And today, my goal is to take you along my Berlin journey in a way that does just that. So let's dive in. The best place to capture the overall ambience and character that defines Berlin is right at the heart. The Mittborough, which literally translates to middle, is the central and most prominent borough in the city. During the Cold War and Germany's separation, Mitt was a part of East Berlin, and while many parts of the former East still reflect the Stalinist-era architecture and design, the core of this borough, most of which was built out well before the Cold War, retains some of the Old World charms that make cities in Europe such visual masterpieces. Dark, red clay terracotta roof lines, occasionally broken up by large bronze domes with golden accents and church spires, blanket the stone, brick, brownstone, glass, and concrete buildings, decorated in fine detail and ornamentalism. While occasional bursts of pastels and bold colors appear in the painted facades, shades of brown are dominant in the color scheme. Narrow roads, hedged by cobbled stone sidewalks, wind through the city, lined with shops, bakeries, cafes, restaurants, and of course, homes. While there are cars zipping through the asphalt streets, large trams screech through, commanding the urban canyons for their own. And while the street grid largely remains intact, a humongous chunk of Berlin was destroyed during the Second World War. That being said, while emulating an old world Berlin, most buildings seem as if they are relatively new. Now the air here in the city center is really dry so the smells aren't super strong, but you definitely get the sense that there's a lot of concrete, stone, asphalt, pavement. Um, it's a very dry smell. Occasionally, sweet wafts carry from the bakeries. Berlin's old town, Nikolai Viertel, which dates to the 1200s, was reconstructed following its destruction in World War II, and while many of the buildings were reconstructed with concrete slabs, typical of East Germany in the years following the war, much of the architecture resembles that of a medieval Berlin, most notably at the center town square, Nikolai's Church. A towering brick and stone structure with twin bronze steeple spires dating to the year 1230, this Romanesque church towers above the small cobbled square. Quaint shops and cafes showcase traditional German craft, and with its quiet soundscape of birds chirping and pigeons cooing, a windy breeze the trickling central fountain, and the clatter of street dining, you almost forget that you're in the heart of the capital city. Right in the center of the Mittborough, surrounded by the deep, murky green river Spree and an adjoining canal, is Museum Island. So right now, wedged in between two rivers, I'm on Museum Island in the Mitt district. So this part of town is 
course, dedicated to museums. Uh, you've got the old art museum, you've got the new art museum, you've got national museums that go back all the way to prehistoric times. But I will say that the one structure on this island that I'm the most interested in is the magnificently domed Berlin Cathedral. And that is where we're heading next. The gargantuan bronze dome, overlooking four smaller ones, top the Baroque Cathedral's stone pillars, suggesting only that something magnificent awaits inside. I'm like really excited to see the inside of this cathedral. It looks so cool from the outside, so let's take a peek. And in fact, that suggestion is correct. The cathedral sanctuary seems as if it simply opens up to the heavens. The interior of the cavernous dome is laced in gold and beautiful murals towering above the stone walls and marble pillars, which are intricately carved in fine details depicting biblical scenes, all while drenched in accents of gold that mimic the dome. Only the sounds of echoes across the stone and marble can be heard in the cavernous hall. After a climb of 267 steps to the top of the dome observatory deck, you'll find stunning aerial views of the patchwork of Berlin. I think the coolest part about being up here on top of the dome is that you can kind of see where the new Berlin that formulated during the socialist era of the 20th century kind of merges together with old Berlin. You can see the visible differences in the architecture. And if you look in this direction, it looks a lot more modernized, a lot more boxy, things like that. Whereas if you look on this side, you'll notice a stronger sea of terracotta and church steeples and spires and things like that that are more indicative of an older Berlin. And of course, blending in the old and the new Berlin doesn't just include 20th century and prior. You'll notice in the distance that some of the modern high-rises that dominate 21st century Berlin are starting to pop up as well. Uh, it's really cool. Berlin is such a multi-layered city. Like, every era of history is represented in the skyline. When you think of Berlin, what image comes to your mind? If your answer is the Brandenburg Gate, then you're not alone. It's perhaps the second most visited landmark in all of Germany, behind the Cologne Cathedral. Now, originally constructed as a city gate back in the 1700s, today the gate serves as more of a symbol as the reunification point between East and West Germany at the close of the Cold War. A modern symbol of a reunited Germany, the neoclassical columned gate, with classical check gates on either side, predates the division of the East and West and was built in the 1800s. Aged bronze roofs top the checkpoints, and a bronze statue of horses pull a chariot atop the structure. On one side, a large tree-lined boulevard lies. On the other, a wide, stone-paved plaza full of tour groups, cyclists, and pedestrians, with the sounds of chatter and chirping birds and the occasional taxicab or rolling suitcase riding along the stone. The Reichstag building isn't just the home of the German parliament, it's a symbol of German democracy. The refurbished, neoclassical building blends both the ornamentalism and attention to detail of the 19th century and the polished glimmer of the new age with its echoing stone halls and gleaming glass and steel walkways. At the center of the building is the house of the German parliament, a cavernous rotunda adorned with seats of blue on two levels, dominated by a large metallic eagle, the symbol of Germany. Above the Parliament Hall sits a striking glass dome with a spiral ramp wrapping around its interior. An elevator ride and climb up the ramp to the top provides yet another stunning vantage point of Berlin's multi-layered cityscape. Near the Brandenburg Gate is a memorial that carries the weight of 2,800 pillars. Literally and figuratively. The memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe, also known as the Holocaust Memorial here in Berlin, is a really somber place. And the design is interesting. Eisman's design intended for this space to feel uneasy. That's why all of the various pillars and blocks uh, are of different shapes. There are 2,800 of these different pillars and blocks 
here in the memorial. And it does the trick. Um, and again, this is just a really, a really somber reminder of one of the worst events in human history, but it also serves as a unique reflection point for humanity to look back and to ensure that nothing like this ever, ever happens again. Past these key symbols of Berlin, and Germany at large, is Tiergarten Park, the Berlin equivalent to New York's Central Park. Tiergarten Park is wild, literally. Like, it feels like an overgrown forest, which is awesome because it feels natural. So many parks are landscaped and made to look pretty and polished. This, this feels like an actual oasis. If it weren't for the sounds of auto traffic off in the distance, overpowering the sounds of chirping birds and the scents of minty pine and dead leaves, you'd have no idea you were right in the middle of a major city. This is pretty great. While much of Berlin was reconstructed in the 20th century, there are many sites in Berlin that were spared during the Second World War. Notably, the churches. An 1824 church called Friedrichs Werders Church, despite receiving some considerable damage in the war, is one of the few remaining structures. The cavernous nave, with its brick, fan-vaulted ceilings, golden wood finishes, and brown marble tiles, retains a distinctly German look, despite its relatively new age. St. Mary's Church, located near the bustling Alexanderplatz, was constructed sometime in the 1200s. The fan vaulted nave is completely painted in white, accented in gray, and layered with deep, dark wooden pews. Medieval portraits and paintings line the walls at eye level. The windows, atypical for churches of the time, are not stained glass. Smelling of musty, old wood, the church has a decidedly museum-like feel to it. Modern history is much more visible in Berlin than the churches of old. Remnants of former East Germany abound in Mitt and the other eastern boroughs. A notable example is along the East Side Gallery, the only strip of the original Berlin Wall left standing. Layered in decades of colorful graffiti and street art, this strip of over 4,000 feet of nearly 10 feet tall concrete lines the river Spree in an almost eerie fashion. Perhaps it's the fact that many people died trying to cross this wall into the west, but the air feels heavier and more somber here. Across town sits Checkpoint Charlie the former military checkpoint between the American sector and the Soviet sector. The original signage and patrol booth remain in the middle of a modern urban canyon, surrounded of course by many tourists and tourist shops. You know, I will say, the KFC store sign above the now entering the American sector sign was poetic in its own weird way. During my time in Berlin, I stayed in what used to be a grand, Socialist Boulevard in the former East Berlin, specifically the Friedrichshain Borough. Now, the architecture in East Germany was really characterized by uh, Soviet architecture, you know, big boxy buildings um, that were a bit more functional and minimalist in design, and big grand wide boulevards. And all of that is still quite present here in this part of Berlin. The buildings are noticeably further apart than in older parts of the city. On Karl Marx Boulevard, a grand roundabout is centered with a metallic fountain of simple shapes and designs. The plain facades seem to be tiled primarily, although some are concrete, sometimes with little patterns along the top to break the consistency, almost all in shades of beige and white. It's not that the buildings are ugly necessarily, they're just reserved and a bit depressing. The patterns and design are still there, but they seem to be minimal and with the perception of strength and durability at the top of mind. Some of the apartment buildings along Karl Marx Boulevard seem to still have rusted Slavic signage on top of them. For example, signs that read Motokov and Makbo Restaurant. There's a certain grunge to this part of the city, and it's clear where the punk rock influence in the city has its roots. Around Alexanderplatz, there's 
lots of trash, cigarettes, and graffiti. You'll hear the sounds of sirens quite frequently in the urban center, particularly in this area. Towering over Alexanderplatz, and really Berlin as a whole, is the TV Turm Tower. Tall, slender, and giving the appearance of a fairy wand or a disco ball, the pointed tower, piercing the Berlin skyline, was once meant to portray the power of communist East Germany. Today, it contains an observation deck and a restaurant. Speaking of restaurants, it's time to dive into my favorite part of what captures the sensory elements of a city, the food. As Germany's capital, Berlin is a great representation of the tastes of Germany, but it also has its own unique flair to add to the table. Here are a few of the foods I tried that really capture the taste of the city. Currywurst. Currywurst was invented right here in Berlin. Now, I tried this before in Cologne, Germany, but at Erdinger am Gendermanmarkt, I tried an even more localized one. The warm, tender sausage, drenched in a curry drizzled sauce reminiscent of barbecue, was even more delicious than I remembered, and with crispy golden french fries to soak up the rest of the sauce, I'd give this dish a 10 out of 10. Bretzels. Breakfast time? Pretzels. Lunch? Pretzels. Slightly buzzed? You guessed it. Pretzels. Soft pretzels are a classic in Germany, and there's no good reason not to indulge in these salty, bready snacks at any opportunity. And, true to my word, I did indulge. Rheinischer Sauerbraten. Braised beef, doused in dark sauce and raisins, accompanied by a heaping scoop of cooked red cabbage and patava klusa, a sponge-like potato dumpling, make up this incredibly hearty dish. This may be the only time you see me eat red cabbage and enjoy it. Berliner Weiss. Okay, so this one caught me off guard. Berliner Weiss is not just your typical beer. Served in a bowl-like goblet, Berliner Weiss is a sour beer usually infiltrated with some type of syrup, most typically raspberry. The result is tart, sour, and certainly raspberry flavored. Do I love raspberry? No. Did I drink it because, well, it's local? Yes, I did. Berlin's favorite drink can be found practically anywhere, but I tried mine in the old town at a small pub called Zum Nuschbaum. Berliner. Berliners are a pastry classic that goes quite well with a large cup of morning, or afternoon, coffee. Quite simply, Berliners are donuts filled with fruit jelly and dusted in powdered sugar. It's hard to top that combination. I only got to spend a few days in Berlin, and even a month-long adventure wouldn't have been enough to get a full grasp of the city. Berlin is no small town, and it's certainly no small story to capture. My hope is that today, through diving in with me through all five senses, you were able to get a sense of the overall ambience and atmosphere of this edgy and cool city in a way that makes you feel as if you've sipped on a pint of Berlin Weiss and walked beneath the monumental Brandenburg Gate too. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.